Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever in the world you might be. I am Safwan Masri, Executive Vice President for Global Centers and Global Development at Columbia University. I am just delighted, really delighted to be bringing to you today my friend and colleague at Columbia, Professor Hamid Dabashi. Hamid is the Hagop Kevorkian Professor of Iranian Studies and Comparative Literature at Columbia. He's well known to audiences around the world through his prolific writing. So he really does not need much of an introduction, but here is my attempt at one. Uh, Professor Dabashi received a dual PhD in sociology of culture and Islamic studies from the University of Pennsylvania and held a postdoctoral fellowship at Harvard University. Hamid is the author of over 100 essays, articles, and book reviews on subjects ranging from Iranian studies medieval and modern Islam, and comparative literature to the philosophy of art, what is referred to as trans aesthetics. He has written 22 books, edited four, and contributed chapters to many more. His book titles include, and I'm going to go through a rather long list just to show you the diversity of his work. His book titles include Authority in Islam, Theology of Discontent, Close Up, Iranian Cinema, Past, Present, and Future. Staging a Revolution, The Art of Persuasion in the Islamic Republic of Iran, and Masters and Masterpieces of Iranian Cinema. Amongst his most recent books are Islamic Liberation Theology, Resisting the Empire, Post-Orientalism, -Oriental Knowledge and Power in Time of Terror, Shiism, A Religion of Protest, Persophilia, Persian culture on the global scene. Iran without borders towards a critique of the post-colonial nation. And Iran, rebirth of a nation, the Shahnameh, the Persian epic as world literature. These titles belie the obvious. Professor Dabashi's expertise in Islam and virtually the entire landscape of Iranian culture is profound. We could have many, many hours of compelling and wide-ranging conversations, perhaps accompanied by film clips from Iranian masterpieces. But today, our discussion will center on his latest book, The End of Two Illusions, Islam After the West, in which Professor Dabashi explores why it is important to dismantle the myths that divide Islam and the West, and learn new ways to reread both Islamic and world histories. In our discussion, we will review, among other related topics, the rise of Islamophobia, military campaigns after 9-11, and the source for a presumption of the West. I encourage our audience to share their questions with us. In the latter portion of our webinar, we will be sure to answer as many of our audience questions as possible. Hamid, a very, very warm, warm welcome to you. And as I stated before we went live, um, I'm privileged that my last sort of uh, hosting um, experience uh, as Executive Vice President of Global Centers, Global Development at Columbia is with you um, before I step down from my position next week. Um, Hamid, welcome, first of all. And yeah, Thank please. You, Safwan. Thank you for that very generous uh, introduction. I'm grateful. Uh, I am equally honored that, uh, as you know, I hold you in utmost respect and admiration. You have been one of the visionary leaders of our university. You have led us through thick and thin some of the most extraordinary events, especially, for example, the issue of misplaced scholars that you initiated and enabled us to be communicative with our colleagues who are uh, in dangerous uh, circumstances and in a number of other aspects of your leadership at Columbia. You have left an indelible mark and what does it mean to be at Columbia? I'm privileged to have known you personally, collegially, and intellectually. Uh, we regret, I deeply am saddened, not only I, I was I just ran into Rashid Khalidi the other day, and we were commiserating that Safwan is leaving. Good for Georgetown. Uh, our colleagues and the students in Georgetown are now going to have an extraordinary visionary leadership of uh, uh, themselves, 
but also as a critical thinker, as an intellectual, as I told you, I'm also happy that we will have this conversation claiming you back for us yeah. as faculty, uh, for whatever glory that you have done as a leader of our university. Thank you, Hamid. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I um, am very humbled by your by your comments, and um, um, I'm also um, I'm really just very eager to delve into um, into into your book, uh, and I hope we will have many opportunities to discuss it in 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 further in further detail. But let me, Hamid, start with a very basic question. Uh, one of motivation. What inspired you to write this book now? I mean, these are things that many of us um, encounter, think about uh, the issue of, um, uh, you know, Orient, the Orient, the West, and, and, and how we um, describe each and Islam and civilizations and cultures and so on. Um, what made you feel that this was the time to write this book. Uh, why did you feel it was important? It is funny, uh, Safwan, that Ilan Pape, in his very generous endorsement of my book, said this book should have been written 200 years ago. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and he's right, somebody should have written it. But you were not it, around 200 years yeah, ago. Yeah, but Maybe exactly, you were. <laughs> exactly. The circumstances, Safwan, that's a very important question. The circumstances of my finally putting it together as I say at the, in the acknowledgement, this book has been in me forever, but if there is a moment to be identified, it is the events of 9-11 here in New York. Uh, as you know, that was an extremely traumatic moment uh, in the history of the United States, in New York in particular. And the uh, commencement of Islamophobia, as you well know, is, doesn't have any specific dates, goes back to the crusade, goes back to any number of other uh, occasions. But uh, as a Muslim living in New York, the events of 9-11 uh, became extremely traumatic because we were caught between uh, a rock and a hard place. That is namely, this is, was done in our name, should not be in our name. And at the same time, we were at the mercy of really the terrible is, uh, rise of Islamophobia. So I remember when the, when the image of these two towers crumbling it immediately reminded me of the two uh, statues of Buddha in Afghanistan, in Bamiyan, that they were also uh, destroyed by the, by the Taliban. And this image of the binary of the two towers uh, became symbolic and iconic for me that this two binary that has been created between Islam and the West is simply fictitious. It doesn't exist historically, it doesn't make sense. And yet, a sustained history of Orientalist imagination has generated this hostility, this binary, this irreconcilable differences between something called Islam and something called the West. And uh, in my articles, essays, various contexts that I appeared to, to be giving talk uh, on that occasion, uh, my point of departure was that in fact, this is a false binary. This is a false animosity that the borderline, if we go back, for example, to the Mediterranean Sea uh, and look at the Eastern Mediterranean Sea, Western Mediterranean Sea, et cetera, you see that there are interactions and there are alternative sites when uh, what today is called the Islamic world and today is called Europe were actually part of a different geography. So mm. part of the uh, project has been to excavate and put forward an alternative geography that existed in which, for example, if you were to put uh, a Muslim philosopher like Averroes, a Jewish philosopher like Maimonides and a Christian philosopher like Aquinas, almost uh, contemporaneous with each other next to each other, today mm. they, would, they look like they were all plagiarizing Aristotle. They were not, they were part of a different world, different conversation. So the task is to retrieve, number one, that, in, that geography that existed in which culture, history, civilization, literature, poetry, painting, etc. they were all part and parcel of a different geography. And then locate like a, like a, uh, a disease, locate the specific time where this binary between Islam and the West emerged, uh, which is basically the function of colonial modernity, uh, then we can handle it. 
So yeah. First, we have to historicize it. Second, we have to say this has not always existed. Third, we have to uh, eradicate it. So that's in, in a nutshell how this came about. Fascinating, fascinating. And there is the geography uh, piece of it that's also very important and the history and of course you know the the uh, the political aspects of it which i think are very very interesting and we will get into our discussion um some of your uh, critiques in the book and acknowledgement also of the works of people uh, of giants like edward said our own and uh, uh, france Fanon, and so on um but let's let's go deeper a little bit into the roots of this I think unexamined presumption, I mean, that's what you state, and I agree with you, of an innate hostility between Islam and the West, right? Um, two vast categories of abstraction. Um, you, call, you talk about the uh, fetishization um, of each. Um, you argue that um, by self-fetishizing, uh, the West also looks to fetishize the other, right? And that has given birth, if you will, to the notion of uh, a Muslim world. You argue that the constitution of this binary, Islam and the West, is in fact a condition of empire and corresponds to a particular period in history, in particular 19th century Europe as the epicenter of civilization. So Ilan um, may have wished for this book to have been written 200 years ago, but so much of it is relevant uh, today with, with, with events, if you will, um, that, uh, that had not existed 200 years ago. So take us down that path and talk to us a little bit about how this false consciousness uh, has survived until today, um, how it was politically manufactured perhaps and intensified, um, again, taking it back to 9-11 and the military campaigns in Afghanistan and then in Iraq. You see, Safwan, yes, you're absolutely correct that it has an immediate political context, but the roots of this binary is actually uh, very much philosophical. And I have in the text identified uh, Hegel, his philosophy of history, as one of the key moments when uh, this linear, this uh, uh, unilateral direction of world history coming towards Europe and disregarding the rest of humanity is articulated. And as I say in the book, Hegel saw himself as the anticipated consequence of Plato, the same way that he saw Napoleon as the anticipated consequence of Alexander the Great. So if you look at the structure of uh, Hegel's philosophy of history, history sort of prehistorical moments begins in Egypt and in India and uh, uh, slightly in, in Persia, the Persian Empire. Then he says, after Persian Empire, the moment we get into the Greeks and into the Romans, then the real history begins and the Geist begins to unfold to come towards Europe and of course center in Germany. That's the real issue that we have. There is this uh, unilateral, unidirectional, uh, and as you know, many of us are crit uh, 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 critical of our own core curriculum. I said that it's like a choo-choo train theory of history. It begins in Athens and comes to the low library, it stops at the low library that now we, we teach uh, a core curriculum. The issue is to begin uh, to see at what moment it's a critique of civilizational thinking that uh, came to culmination politically with the, uh, the theory of clash of civilization of uh, of, of a recent vintage. Uh, my point is that uh, uh, the manufacturing of these civilizations, say Islamic civilization or Chinese civilization or Indian civilization or Egyptian civilization, these are all alternatives that were created on the Hegelian model in order to corroborate something called Western civilization, mm. which is self, very self-conscious, is a bourgeois phenomenon. Yeah. It replaced, as Safwan, as you know well, it replaced another concept, which was Christendom, uh, that is throughout me medieval history. We don't have the concept of Western civilization. We have the concept of Christendom. Christendom was uniting everything. But with the advent of the uh, Protestant revolution, of uh, uh, industrial revolution and ultimately the French Revolution and the rise of nation states and when national cultures begin to be formed, then there is this uh, umbrella, this uh, uh, awning 
that puts uh, all of these Western European countries together and calls itself Western civilization. Right. And in order for this Western civilization to believe itself, because it's ultimately a bourgeois self-conscious phenomenon knows how shallow it is, because if you go deeper in its own past, you begin to see diversities of, of all sorts. For example, the presence of Muslims in European context is, I mean, it has always uh, existed. It is with moments such as Mozart's abduction from Seraglio that you see how the Austro-Hungarian Empire in opposition to the, to the Ottomans begin to create hostility and, and uh, alterity with the Ottoman Empire. So there are specific moments in history. But if right. you go back and begin with early 18th century with Hegel, you see how this is woven into the very philosophical foundation right. of European self-imagination. Right, and, and you discuss Hegel, you also discuss Immanuel Kant um, along the same lines, right? And how he, you know, creates sort of the Western subject and unsubjects, um, if you will, the other, uh, which I found um, also fascinating, you know, those, those, uh, uh, those treatments, um, if you will. Um, you, um, you mention the, uh, when you talk about Christendom and, and Western civilization or the West, and you talk also in the book about how they served one another very well. And I couldn't help but think, maybe simplistically, um, as I was reading that, thinking of the marriage between Wahhabism and Saudism, which dates back to the middle of the 18th no, it's century. Not it's not simplistic at all. But in the context of European history, uh, Safwan, as you know well, it happens earlier. It happens in the 16th century. And yes. we have a wonderful document, in, wonderful I mean, in terms of historical documentation, not for the substance, because the substance is really horrific, which is Bartolomeo de las Casas' text, a short uh, uh, account of the destruction of the Indies, written in the middle of the 16th century by a Franciscan friar who was witness to the horrors that the conquistadors were per visiting upon the Native Americans. It is at that moment, I have argued, and it is in the book, that Christendom and Christianity begins to put itself at the service of the idea of the emerging uh, sort of um, bourgeois conception of Christianity, when Christianity makes itself useful to the idea of imperial uh, expansion. And you're absolutely correct, it's a, it's a brilliant insight that Wahhabism and the Saudi family kind of have a similar kind of a, a, a symbiotic, symbiotic relationship, uh, but it's a very limited, as you know, for the rest of uh, the Muslim world or, or Arab world. In your own absolutely brilliant book on Tunisia, we see how, in fact, if, if you laser beam on any one specific Arab country like Tunisia or Egypt or Palestine, wherever. There are different factors that have been involved. But in the case of the relationship, symbiotic relationship between Christianity and uh, imperialism, that becomes very uh, co-productive to the yeah. point that in fact, British colonial officers were not happy with the influence of Christian missionaries, say mm -hmm. in India. And uh, as you know, our colleague uh, in English department, Gauri Vishenathan, who was one of the most brilliant students of Edwards, Allah Yarhamhu, she wrote a book on uh, Mask of Conquest of how the rise of English departments in India, India was the site of the rise of English, uh, uh, department, English literature departments, was in fact to combat uh, the significance and power and presence of uh, Christian missionaries in India by kind of a liberal, literary liberal uh, tradition of European literature to replace uh, uh, Christian missionaries. So let's stay with the, within the academy for a little bit because you talk in the book about uh, the core at Columbia University, something that Columbia College has been famous for for a very long time. And um, um, you talk about um, how when we taught Western civilization um, and then changed that to contemporary civilization, the West still stood for Western civilization and the rest only corroborated its unique superiority. And um, you also say that by calling it, you know, that the West in fact seeks to 
colonize the time as well as the space of our worldly existence when you call it contemporary civilization. So the only contemporary that exists by implication is the West. Exactly. It's yeah. non-existent in the present. Yeah. Um, so how do we, I mean, you know, it's a bit premature because we'll get to that towards the end in terms of, you know, where do we go from here? Um, but how do you also, as somebody who teaches, I think, in the core, right? Um, and uh, this is, you know, you talk about Colombia because that's the experience and because Colombia is famous for its core, but uh, this is replicated in a lot of other places, right? So do you mind commenting on that? Absolutely. Uh, as you know, um, uh, even better than I do, the, the origin of our core curriculum is in the, in the immediate aftermath of World War I, when uh, the GIs were coming back home and they didn't know why they were fighting, so they told them, okay, you were fighting for Western civilization. Uh, we have a funny joke about women during World War I going to Oxford and getting hold of an Oxford professor and saying, young man, what are you doing for Western civilization? And yes. the Oxford Don says, ma'am, I am Western civilization. <laughs> so uh, it begins our core curriculum by way of uh, addressing these issues in the immediate aftermath of the war. But eventually, as you know, uh, the demography changes. The demography changes not only in, uh, in, uh, at Columbia, but throughout uh, United States. In the aftermath of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, uh, for every uh, seven Asian and Latino that comes to the United States, one Western European comes to the United States, and subsequent de decades, six. So in when, uh, when George Europe was our president, uh, I was actually on, on, uh, on leave. We had a hunger strike by some of our students demanding diversity in the core, and I was invited to be part of a uh, blue ribbon committee that Ira Katz Nelson uh, presided over and etc. So diversification of the core began as a long history. Initially, they called it uh, major cultures. And I went to Eileen Gululi, our colleague, and I said, you mean minor cultures, right? Uh, then they subsequently changed it to global core. Now they call it global core. I said, you mean local core, right? So, I mean, we are part, I have, I have taught in the core curriculum. I chaired the committee on the core curriculum under Austin Quigley, but I've always been advocating to this day for this component of the core that we call uh, major culture or global uh, uh, core. And then after teaching at more, more than 30 years, 35 years, finally, our colleagues have allowed me to offer a course, I call it critical, uh, comparative critical theory, in which I collapse the two. I intentionally collapse the Western component and the non-Western component into one course. And you know, to their credit and to their uh, generosity of their thinking, they have allowed me, and I'm, uh, every semester that I teach it, I have hundreds of students uh, in that cur uh, curriculum. So uh, uh, going back to your point, both pedagogically, Safwan, and epistemologically, it is possible, and I have done it, I'm just reporting to you that I have performed it and I have had uh, uh, very popular courses in, in this respect, that we bring the two together and create a tertiary space that uh, a different kind of critical thinking is uh, enabled. But as you know, again, better than I do, there are institutional interests uh, and inter institutional reasons that the, uh, the, bi the bifurcation between the West and the rest remains the same. Mm, 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 mm. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the rise of Islamic fundamentalism, fu fundamentalism and um, you know, to dismantle the binary opposition between Western civilization and Islamic fundamentalism you go into, as you described at the beginning, sort of a, an act of historical archaeology, right? And you focus, I think, in a very um, enlightening way on Islam prior to its encounter with the West and European modernity. And here I go back, you know, to, to one area that I focus on, which is Al-Nahda um, in the late 19th century in uh, in Egypt, right? And the... the um, uh, what some had seen, uh, you know, the, the continuum, if you will, of the 
uh, elite leadership that wanted to copy everything that was Western and was enamored and fetishizing, if you will, in a positive way, everything that was Western and uh, those who rejected um, anything that was Western as colonial and those in the middle, if you will, who um, saw that actually adopting Western sciences in particular um, is not at odds with, with Islam. But, but all of this, um, it was really, um, it, you know, fantastically um, complex and 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 interesting. And uh, you you know, you historize the discursive formation of the West, right? And you know, there are people like Fanon and I think Edward who um, talked about, um, uh, you know, how. Um, the West is the flip side of the Orient that we also fetishized, right? As right. I right. say, we as as Arab Muslim, exactly. uh, you know, the discourse on self orientalization and internal colonization um, really, you know, spoke a lot about this. So, um, talk to us um, a little bit. Uh, um, about this. I think the po good point of departure you just mentioned is. Um, in the encounter with European colonialism, think of uh, French in Algeria or in Egypt, even earlier in Egypt, think of Italian in Libya, think of the British in Palestine uh, or in India. These are the moments that create uh, a, a serious intellectual anxiety and in intellectual angst among Muslims. Here, Muslim intellectuals from the generation of uh, Al-Afghani and Muhammad Abdu and Rashid Radha, all the way to contemporary, they become the chief uh, architects of stripping Islam of its multifaceted aspects, its philosophical traditions, its uh, mystical traditions, its scientific art, architecture, etc and turning the entirety of Islam into a singular site of contestation with European colonialism. You, Muslim intellectuals, Arab intellectuals are far more responsible for this extraordinary damage that they did to the totality of, uh, of Islamic tradition. Our friend and colleague Ahmad Dallal has a beautiful book, it's called Islam Before Europe. Yes. Uh, uh, Duke University Press, in which he goes to this sort of 17th century Muslim critical thinkers that is still Europe is not a category. Uh, in a way, my book is a sort of a complement to what Ahmad did. Uh, so in the aftermath of that, what is lost, and here is the significance of your ref reference to Al-Nahda, is the totality and the singular fact that Islam is a biological religion. Islam has always been in dialogue. Islamic philosophy emerged in, in uh, dialogue with uh, 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 Greek philosophy, Islamic theology in dialogue with uh, Jewish theology, with uh, Hindu mysticism, etc., etc. It has Utlubul Elb Hat of Sin, we say. The, the, our prophet said Utlubul Elb Hat of Sin, seek knowledge even in China. Uh, etc etc so, so we have a claim as a muslim the, the quranic phrase Hal are those who know and those who don't know equal the centrality of knowledge of getting to know has to do with the with the uh, imperial civilization from the umayyads to the abbasids to the saljuqids uh, all the way to the ottomans and the safavids and the Mughals. Uh, Islam has had a claim on the world in every aspect, in everything that happens, science, technology, art, architecture, philosophy, whatever it is. Avicenna did not think of himself commenting on Aristotle. He, th he thought of himself as a second or a third after Al-Farabi, uh, 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 Aristotle. Right. right. Yeah. So it is important to retrieve that multifaceted world of Islamic civilization that is rich, is diversified. It is uh, the, the legal scholars are going one way, the philosophers are going another way, the mystics have come in and say, hello, you got it all wrong. So you have to put Ibn Arabi on one side and Avicenna on the other side, and then uh, Ibn Haytham on the other uh, side to see that what subsequently in encounter with European colonialism became a singular site of contestation. Islam is good, uh, the West is, is 
is bad. This is where the issue starts. And as I say in the book, Europhobia is the worst kind of Eurocentricism. Right. The issue uh, uh, that Europe is evil. Europe is not evil. Europe is just a civilization like any other civilization. So you need to decenter Europe, not to demonize Europe, in order to have a different conception of world history. Right, right, right. No, fascinating. Um, it is, it, it is, and, and you talk also about uh, anti Americanism uh, as a form of racism as well, right? Yeah. That, that, puts everything to, uh, yeah, I mean, and, 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 you know, some have argued that this is sort of the outgrowth, um, it's a post-colonial or, or sorry, an anti-colonial response, right? Colonial, either in its uh, political or cultural or economic um, manifestation. Um, you know, the, the, um, you talk about Aristotle, you talk about Al-Farabi, and isn't it true, Hamid, that uh, the West actually owes its knowledge of the great Greek and Roman philosophers to the Muslims? Because weren't people like Adelaide of Bath, you know, who uh, took what, what, what were the only um, uh, available, if you will, translations of Greek works that resided in places like Baghdad and um, took those translations to the West where, um, you know, everything had been um, had been destroyed during the the uh, the Middle Ages. That is, that is uh, uh, absolutely correct, though I have a slightly different conception of this period, which is not to say, OK, philosophy began in uh, in Greece, then it died in the medieval and dark ages, but Muslims were doing it. And then during the Renaissance and enlightenment, uh, they, the Muslims gave it back to Europe and, and that's it. I have a different conception. We need to reimagine the philosophical tradition. I always put it kind of provocatively that mm -hmm. if I were to Plato and went to him, I said, Mr. Plato, you know, Sabah al khair, ahla wa sahla. My <laughs> name is Hamid and I am Persian. He may not like me because of the, you know, Thermopylae and the, all of the uh, uh, wars between the Greeks and the Persians, but he knows who I am. Mm. But if Heidegger went to Plato and said, Mr. Plato, I'm German, he wouldn't know who he is because there were no Germans or French or British or uh, Irish or anything of that sort. So we have to begin to reimagine the fact that one singular text one singular text. Xenophon's Cyropedia is a, a mirror for princes that Xenophon, who was a contemporary of Plato, and both of them as students of Socrates, wrote imagining the life of Cyrus the Great and offered it as a mirror for princes that for generations was ultimately reaches Machiavelli when he writes his, uh, his prince. In mm -hmm. other words, it is to be, I can argue that for generations and centuries, in fact, Xenophon's Cyropedia that ultimately reaches Thomas Jefferson, I have seen the co copy of uh, Xenophon's with uh, in uh, Thomas Jefferson's library in, in Library of Congress. And on the margin, he writes to his son, this is an important book, you have to read it because they were using it as a model of leadership. It has very little to do with the factual evidence of uh, Cyrus's life, but it has to do with Xenophon's imagination of leadership, how leadership is done. So that completely recasts mm. our conception of European history, particularly in political terms, that then comes all the way down to the 16th century when Machiavelli is writing his, his prince. So the more we do that, the fact that in uh, say 11th, 12th and 13th century, uh, Muslim uh, scientists were doing extraordinary work in science and in mathematics and astrophysics. That becomes an issue that was the subject of our colleague who just retired and now is in Beirut, George, George Saliba. George Saliba's work in the history of science uh, is far more important than saying, oh, they all got it from us. He remaps the Mediterranean world. By remapping it, then suddenly in Italy, in Italian uh, libraries, having access to 
uh, Arabic sources that they sometimes they couldn't even read Ya Safwan, the kind of uh, like a painting that drew uh, what they were saying because they, the, the knowledge of Arabic was limited, is very normal. I'll give you another perfectly uh, normal example. When Miguel Asim Palacios, the distinguished uh, Spanish uh, scholar, <coughs> wrote an essay about the possible influence of the Miraj, of the uh, journey of the prophet to, uh, to the heavens on uh, Dante, divine comedy, uh, many dontologists were up in arms, you know, you know it's impossible, because Dante rightly is a, is a matter of pride for uh, Italians. But if you look at it, not from the perspective of Italian or <coughs> Tunisian, North African history, from the perspective of the Mediterranean Sea, mm. it is perfectly plausible for Dante to have had access to the Latin translations, as Miguel Asin Palacios argues, of the divine, of, of the uh, Meiraj literature. Now, what does that mean? It, that, it means recasting our conception of Islam in the West in a way that includes the uh, mm. Mediterranean Sea as the epicenter of it. Right. Uh, and as a result, when you are in a site like, in a site like Egypt, like, like Iraq or like Palestine, you see multifaceted presence of Christianity, of Islam, of Judaism, historically have always existed, uh, then it is not surprising. So my response is to, my, my reaction is to uh, people like former President Barack Obama or uh, Muslims and Jews have been fighting for thousands of years. That's simply gibberish, it's not true. It doesn't, it has never existed, is a, is a, anachronism that you take a contemporary specific cases and catapult it into history. Right, right. And you talk about that. You talk about sort of the, the uh, um, can you actually expand on that a little bit? Because you do talk about the um, uh, Christo-Judaic or Judeo-Christian um, tradition and uh, you know, many argue that that is sort of a 20th century um, a creation, if you will, or invention um, that pits it against Islam, right? Whereas, okay. sorry, exactly. You know, Look at who yeah. is now using expressions such as Judeo-Christian uh, is people like uh, uh, Bannon or people like Marine Le Pen. They are, and also is an anxiety, post-Holocaust anxiety. They know what has happened in the history of uh, European history, whereas in the point of fact, the relationship between Islam and, and Judaism is far more rooted. I mean, especially if you go to languages like Judeo-Arabic, uh, 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 philosophers uh, like Rambam Maimonides wrote in Judeo-Arabic, Delalatul Hayrin, that's what the book, uh, the, his famous book is Delalatul Hayrin, Guide, Guide to the Perplex. Yeah. If you look at, for Judeo-Persian is the same thing, the entire Pentateuch, uh, <coughs> Safwan, is recast as a form of Shahnameh. Moses uh, appears and uh, uh, Joshua, etc. And rightly so, because after all, Esther, one of the seminal books in the Bible, was a Persian queen. So mm -hmm. it is not sort of outlandish for Judeo-Persian, Judeo-Arabic to become re, to become factors for us to reimagine the history of the region in a way that uh, Muslims and Arabs and Iranians and uh, and Jews have a different history than the one that the contemporary condition in right. Palestine has generated. Right. right, right, and that that in itself that whole question is worth. <laughs> An entire conversation. I mean, oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And I, you know, found the quote from your book where you say the assumption that Judaism and Christianity are Western and stand opposite to Islam is constitutionally flawed and entirely ahistorical. Yeah. Um, so I want to bring into this a question that's posed in the QA by a colleague uh, of ours, a good friend, uh, Kendall Thomas, um, who is a critical theory uh, professor, among uh, many other things, to his. Uh, um, to, 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 to his portfolio at the law school. And Kendall asks, um, in light of your conversation about the co-productive relationship between Christianity and the Western imperial project, I wonder whether Islam after the Christian West might not have been a more, a more um, 
a opposite subtitle for Professor Dabashi's book. Uh, I know Kendall well. I'm a great admirer of him. I'm happy he, he has joined us. Uh, it could be. I mean, you could go in that direction. My uh, point in, in that subtitle, Islam after the West, was, uh, first of all, the title, as you all know, is borrowed from Freud. Freud said the future of an illusion. I call the future of two illusions because the two are sort of mirroring each other. But I want to see what happens. I want that is, I am marking the moment when Islam as a multifaceted religion that now has entered a different kind of interlocution with its world history. And I give the example of Malcolm X, I give uh, multiple other examples that, that Islam is no longer just in the so-called Islamic world, is right here in, in the United States, is in Europe, is all over the place. This new worldliness of Islam, the fact that now English and French and German are new Islamic languages, is not just Arabic and Persian and Turkish. There are many Muslim thinkers who actually are thinking in English and, and German and, and uh, have a whole chapter on uh, deracializing civilization, which is on Malcolm X, and taking him as a, a centerpiece of how to reimagine Islam in terms that are no longer alienating that an American uh, feels alienated from the experience of being a Muslim by looking at a figure like, a figure like Malcolm X. Uh, the issue is, if we follow my argument that historically Islam has always been a, a polyvocal and polylocal religion, it has always been in conversation with its, uh, its neighbors, its context, <clears throat> then the new context, the fact that Islam is now a quintessential aspect of American experience or European experience, and not just by virtue of migration, but by virtue of remapping a uh, history of the United States in which we have the first uh, Muslims, in fact, in the form of African-American slaves who have come to the United States. So that recasts our understanding of Islam in Asia, Africa, Latin America, e and including the United States, particularly with attention to contemporary elements of worldliness, Muslims in the world. So we have a different, yes, Islam is still dialogical. It's, it's impossible for Islam not to be dialogical. But instead of with Greek philosophy or uh, Jewish theology or uh, Indian mysticism, it is in dialogue with a different kind of environment. Paramount, as I say towards the end of the work, is our environmental issues, our mass migration, our refugee uh, circumstances. 850 million human beings going to, to, to world hungry every night. That is the issue. Uh, uh, and symbolically, I say a sinking boat on the Mediterranean between Tunisia and, and Italy, that is the site of our reimagining Islam. Uh, and that is no longer as west, east, north, south, it's just a sinking boat. That is where Islam needs to be rearticulated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can we turn to Edward Said? Um, because you do offer uh, a critique, you acknowledge his work, and you actually say, we did not know how we know what we know until the publication of Edward Said's Orientalism, right? Exactly. Uh, he was the first to address the problem of representation, who gets to represent whom, and made people think about modes of knowledge production in relation uh, to power. Uh, but you also offer a critique of Orientalism, and you call for a need to see the larger and longer patterns of transnational public spheres of resistance against imperialism. Exactly. Um, you even uh, say that, and I'm looking for it here, uh, you say Saeed, due to his own invested interest in Enlightenment humanism, fell short of fully exposing the barbarity that European capitalist modernity has perpetrated upon the world. Elaborate, please. <laughs> uh, I always say about Edward, uh, as you know, I'm deeply, uh, you know, have a deep affection for him. He's not just a friend or a colleague or a comrade, that we are all pygmies standing on the shoulder of a giant. That is, he enabled us, this very language with which I have written this book, is Edward Said enabled us. We are not Saidian, but we are all enabled by the way Said uh, talked. So I begin by historicizing. You remember that he was a Palestinian. Uh, 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 Orientalism is very much a product of the uh, 
of the uh, between 67 and 73. That's the, the environment that uh, created Orientalism. 74, he had the sabbatical uh, from Columbia. Jonathan Cole was our uh, provost at the time. And then he went to Stanford and that's where he wrote uh, Orientalism. The, uh, I say that he was not a historian. He was a literary critic. We now, subsequent generations of uh, uh, scholars enabled by Edward Said, now begin to historicize Orientalism. That Orientalism of the Greeks vis-a-vis -vis the Persian was not Orientalism of domination, was uh, Orientalism of rivalry. The Orientalism of the uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire around the time of Mozart was a, was a uh, Orientalism of uh, despising the, the enemy rather than of domination. So we need to separate them and then in my post-Orientalism, I argue that with the collapse of the Soviet Union, classical Orientalism yields to the rise of uh, area studies department. And area studies uh, eventually leave uh, the site of the university and go to think tanks where nobody uh, is held responsible. If Fuad al uh, uh, wrote a book about, oh yes, uh, go to Iraq and, and start bombing and they will welcome you with baklava and rose water in, as an academic and as academic uh, 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 book. And then they started bringing the body bags home. Somebody would have hold them responsible in an academic context. But in think tanks, you know, no longer nobody, anybody is held accountable for anything. They can say whatever they want. So it is, I call it disposable knowledge. It is created, US wants to in, invade Afghanistan. Certain disposable knowledge is created for Afghanistan or Iraq or Somalia or whatever, and it leaves. So this, the, we, we should not sort of fixate Orientalism that universities are the sites of, of its productions. It has evolved. So if you, we take the insight of Edward Said, which is the relationship between knowledge and power, and expanded historically from uh, ancient the classical antiquity all the way to, uh, to our own period, you see how his insight begins to sing and dance in a different way. Mm -hmm. And especially if we no longer are beholden as Edward was, I mean, he called it, uh, his critiques called, a, called it a residual humanism. And it's a magnificent passage in one of the, uh, uh, epilogues that he wrote to Orientalism before his passing, that uh, some of my ardent critics say that there is residual humanism in my, uh, in my scholarship. Uh, it, it, uh, Orientalism is not a machine. It's an act of advocacy. I mean, you can see him in, in exasperation. And then in the first posthumous book that Akil, our colleague, Akil Bergarami, uh, edited and published on humanism, he, you see him trying to come to terms with the issue of human, hum, uh, humanism in comparative terms. And here, uh, uh, I gave him a copy of uh, uh, George McDessey, my own teacher uh, at Penn, who wrote uh, two magnificent books, one on rise of humanism in Islam and one on rise of uh, colleges. And uh, until his passing, Mariam recently returned it to me, my, my, uh, George's, George Magnus's book on uh, Islamic humanism, Arab humanism, was with him, was, was with Edward. He, if you read his uh, first posthumous book, tries to address the issue of the centrality of uh, European humanism by making it comparative and contrapuntal. This was his forte. So we have to be critically intimate with Edward enough to know how he kept correcting himself. Extraordinary mm. mind. No, and then th this is, was not by kind of mere act of humility, but by act of theoretical sophistication. He right. knew by introducing the element of contrapuntal thinking, his system, the system of his thinking is always alive and, and vivacious and can account. And, and as I have repeatedly said, I would not have been able to put pen to paper. I would have been obscure. Uh, sort of uh, scholar of Iran, if it were not for Edward Said, he unleashed our, our tongue. Did you ever, I mean, long before this book became a project, you must have had conversations with him uh, about the, um, you know, the, the claim that you make, uh, the, the, which, which, which resonates, you know, that he was a victim of sort of, not, not a victim, but, but sort of, uh, trapped in his appreciation of uh, Western humanism, right? Because that's what he studied, that's what he taught, and so on and so forth. And there is, 
a, an adjunct to that, which is that Orientalism has also been accused of perhaps stripping um, Arabs or Muslims of agency in that they appear as sort of a um, exclusively sort of as the victim. You know, but one of the things I really like about your book is that you're saying that the West self fetishizes and then fetishizes the other, but Muslims are also, you know, in a very complex but but equal way, uh, fetishizing and 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 you know what what you said, you know, you, uh, um, Europhobia is 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 a form, yeah, of 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 doing exactly that. Do you ever have those conversations with her? Well, absolutely. Our, our relationship was multiple and multifaceted. We served on uh, on search committees, on dissertation committees, wonderful conversations, especially when a prominent uh, scholar or literary figure, Ahdaf Swaif, we used to host here. Ah. And Nasr Abu Zaid, he uh, uh, came here. So on those occasions, we will have many such conversations. The most cogent critique apropos humanism was written by uh, his friend and colleague and comrade, uh, James Clifford. James Clifford in his review uh, said that there is this residual humanism as he as Said uh, cites him and uh, says that Edward is not Foucauldian enough. So mm. I reversed it and I said at some point, well, Foucault was not Edward Saidian enough. Namely, the centrality of the issue of Palestine for Edward was the catalyst for him of, uh, of critical uh, thinking. Uh, so we, uh, we, we had repeated conversations. The issue is, uh, I give you sort of an anecdote. I was about to go to the Marama Butterfly. Uh, uh, we were both co-hosting a conference. He said, where are you going? I said, tonight I'm going to see Butterfly. Mar Mar Butterfly. Uh, he said, oh, what is this, this uh, uh, Orientalist uh, gibberish you're going to watch? I said, well, I have to come to my own con uh, conclusion. The th that was the preparatory stage that I was writing on Puccini, again, following Edward's uh, path, mm -hmm. writing on Puccini, but not on Mar Mar Butterfly, on... Uh, on Turandot, on a different Puccini, because of our tracing his genealogy all the way from a medieval Persian poem by Nizami coming to Europe and then, and then Goethe taking it to Schiller and Schiller turning it into a play. I mean, I was all busy doing with the, the, the historical trajectory of how uh, an Armenian in Venice translated a poem of Nizami into Italian and gave rise to Commedia della Arte. So these were the conversations that we, we had. Uh, I mean, yeah. I, both yeah. it's funny and it's also delightful, but also it makes me extremely sad that we, we don't have him uh, uh, anymore. So yes, we did. Uh, and then as you know, there were critiques like uh, Ejaz Ahmad who recently passed away, who wrote an Edward, uh, but those of us who have a critical edge with the, the, the uh, you know, aspects of Edward's writing, you know, the famous phase of, uh, phrase of Aristotle, uh, I love Plato, but I love truth more. He has enabled us to make those kinds of uh, divergence from him and historicization of him. But in, in is impossible, as I always say, to think in terms without uh, Edward Said's writing. Now, apropos the question of passivity, that you're absolutely correct, some have leveled against Edward in Orientalism. He wrote a whole book in response to that. Culture and imperialism is in fact the, exactly the opposite direction. He was going to account for how, which, yeah. Yeah, which speaks to what you said earlier about how his thinking always evolved. Exactly, how he, exactly. he changed his mind and he had that sort of, you know, confidence to be able to do so and yeah. to... But not in a way, I mean, if you begin with the world of text and the critique, you see the central idea of contrapuntal that, that he brought to critical thinking from his musical uh, uh, education and his closeness to Adorno, his, he, he took that idea and it became central to his critical thinking that he could keep producing and correcting and adjusting his vision in yeah. a way that will not be inconsistent with uh, what he had said earlier. So with time running out, we have five minutes left and I've integrated a couple of questions that have come to us from the audience and with apologies to my colleague Mervik, 
Espahani, who was going to do the Q&A, but this conversation has just been going, I think, wonderfully well. Uh, let me, if I may, pose to you two or three final thoughts, questions from the audience, and then leave them with you to address whatever you want to address and, and, and have your um, closing thoughts, if you will, anything that we didn't get to. Um, so one deals with the issue of women and comes from Julieta Almida Rodriguez, who um, emphasizes that she's asking this question with the utmost respect. Uh, but she says that the position of women in these two civilizations, right, which we're trying to, uh, <laughs> to eradicate that sort of binary thinking, um, you know, don't you think the West is far more advanced? Um, this is not a question of hostility between East and West, but uh, feeling that in the West has given women a position. Uh, so that's one question. Um, I want to um, bring also um, another question uh, that comes to us from, I mean, there's a great question, but I don't think we have time here to address it, and I'm not sure, uh, but today is Juneteenth, or yesterday was Juneteenth, today is the Juneteenth holiday. Um, and Howard Spordick asks about um, people who were brought as slaves from Africa, Muslims who were brought as slaves uh, from Africa and did they practice Islam and so on. Um, there is um, a couple of questions from, from colleagues that I want to also bring in. Um, Avinom uh, Shalem, um, who asks, uh, if I'm not wrong, uh, you argue that it was the age of European expansions, I assume refer to the expansions of the Habsburgs, Spain and Portugal 16th century. I wonder though, why not going back to earlier moments because the consolidation of Christendom and the empire happened much earlier in Byzantium, Constantinople. Um, which then brings me back to Istanbul uh, because that is um, the global center actually that has brought this together. So my thanks are to Merve, Epec, Shem Taha, and all of their colleagues there. And Mustafa Say, who is one of our supporters and um, uh, supports actually the program on Islamophobia at the global center, um, asks what specific actions uh, could we do? Uh, could we take to reverse? Um, you know the the uh, what 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 has been uh, going on, and there is a similar question from um, from I can't find it anymore. So I don't know from Anis, Anisa Abuzian, uh, what should the new foundations and operating principles of a new global cultural space look like? So um, addressing the issue of women. Uh, perhaps if you have a chance to comment on the issue of uh, Muslim slaves uh, brought in from Africa, and then where do we go uh, from here? Uh, first of all, you mentioned a number of my dear friends uh, uh, that uh, the, the questions they raise are important and central to my argument. All I can say right now is about gender. Uh, I like to ask, my chapter six is entirely on gender is called gendering the difference. Uh, and it is creating a tertiary space. It's not that Islam is good and West is bad or West is good or Islam is the bad. But uh, ironically, we're talking at a time that right now the Roe versus Wade for which generations of uh, American uh, uh, women's rights activists have been fighting right now is in jeopardy. Uh, it is not that the, the status of women is in the Islamic world is any better, but it is a common space as uh, Leila Abu Logot, our colleague, it's a recent book, Harvard University Press, Do Muslim Women Need Saving? They need agency to determine whether uh, if uh, veil is imposed on them in Iran is as horrible as it is denied them in Paris. So the, Sarkozy and Ahmadinejad have a commonality that the body of woman has become a site of contestation, either put the veil on or take it uh, off. Uh, so I refer the colleague to chapter six, gendering the difference uh, uh, in, in the book. As uh, regarding the question of uh, race, the same is true. That is the chapter on seven is de-racing civilization, which is mostly on uh, Malcolm X. And the issue of a slavery in Islam is perfectly normal. In fact, in Doha, where you're going, there is a, there is a museum of uh, slavery. 
but the only issue is that they con their conception of the of uh, race of uh, slavery is very much influenced by American experience of uh, slavery. So they only concentrate on Africa, whereas, as you know, in Islamic history, a considerable part of slavery co comes actually from Central Asia. The Mamluk that formed ultimately uh, an empire, uh, a dynasty in Egypt, where Mamluk means uh, uh, slaves. Uh, now, uh, uh, I mean, qu the question regarding uh, where to start the point yeah. of uh, consolidation of Christianity, he's absolutely correct. We can go back to any point in history, but my uh, uh, concern at this stage is just to fix on the period of colonial modernity when, when Christianity sort of puts itself at the disposal of, the, of colonialism, uh, something that now in, uh, in an amazing HBO book uh, film on uh, 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 Exterminate All the Brutes based on the book uh, is now brought forward. Uh, now, I, there were many all wonderful questions, uh, but uh, I, I don't want to, I want to respect the time and I don't want to rush all I can say. Merve just told me if it's okay with you, uh, we can extend by a few minutes. It's 102 now, and I think we can go until 110. Um, I think we will have uh, um, audience members who will stick around. They are sticking around. I'll, I'll, I'll happily uh, stick around. Uh, uh, I just want to say, encourage colleagues and friends to just sort of spend some time with the book. There will be, uh, I, recently we had a launch here, physical by my, coll my colleagues, uh, Bashir and uh, uh, others, uh, my chair, uh, uh, Gil Hochberg and uh, others who talked about my, uh, my book. And when I was inviting them, I told them, I promise you, you will not be bored uh, re reading. Uh, uh, I can uh, attest to that. And I encourage everyone so to I, get I encourage multiple you. copies of it. <laughs> uh, the, the, uh, ultimately, what I want to say is that this book is farthest removed by camouflaging the horrors that we see in the Islamic world or ignoring or excusing or historicizing or anything of that sort of the equally atrocious things that are happening in the so-called West is in fact dismantling it and creating an environment in which massive uh, movements of uh, migration and refugees, et cetera, have recast the global history. Two factors at the end of the book become very paramount. One is environmental issues, which no longer is east, west, north, south, is, uh, uh, is, is global. And one is uh, migration. Uh, according to UN, 320 million human beings uh, roam around the globe regularly uh, in search of jobs. The same statistics from UN says that 850 million human beings go to bed hungry every uh, night. These are new parameters and factors, Safwan, that our understanding of uh, the world, contemporary world and sort of critically recasting our gaze back in, uh, in history, has to keep these factors paramount in mind. No longer we have the luxury or the idiocy of saying, oh, Islam is better than the West is better or West is worse than, than Islam. These categories are all gone. My hope and, and um, aspiration is that in fact, this book would, would, will begin a different kind of critical thinking that we decenter Europe a book that I published recently with, and again, Muslim intellectuals and, and thinkers are more responsible about this than Orientalists. I recently published with, uh, with Cambridge University uh, Press a book about travelers, travelers who went from India and Iran uh, around the globe for generations. Scholars like Bernard Lewis, they were casting this for the Muslim discovery of Europe. Or even Ibrahim Abu Logod, Allah Yarhamu, he wrote a book about how Arabs went to Europe. They did not go to Europe, Safwan. They go around the world, including Europe. So they have, they, some of them went to Latin America, some of them went to uh, South Africa, some of them were performing their Hajj pilgrimage, they're going to India. Yes. The quintessential traveler was Ibn Battuta. <laughs> Ibn Battuta, and then they, no, I, we're talking about even the contemporary. A book, two volume book by one such traveler that has 
you know, 1500 pages, only 20 pages is in Paris, is on Paris. But you have 25 pages on Cairo. We, is, yeah. Cairo last time we checked was not Europe. So we need to decenter Europe, not to throw it away, some of our best friends are European, but bring them into the fold of humanity and rethink and create a tertiary space, which is neither Islamic nor European, the West, etc., but is, is fed, is informed, is animated, is excited by the comp contemporary issues that now we have. Right now, see our colleagues in Istanbul or in in Amman or in uh, Tunis or in New York. We are through this technology, we are speaking a common language and that language we have appropriated it right now arabic uh, 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 english is also a, a, an islamic language because people talk, talk with it uh, and uh, uh, express their ideas and aspirations so we need to stop this sort of uh, the 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 quote with which i start the book from a from a thing mirror from snow white and the seven dwarfs mirror mirror on the wall Who's the fairest of them all? We have to put a stop to this silliness. We have far more urgent issues yeah. on our hands yeah. that uh, require attention. Yeah. Yeah. yeah ab absolutely. 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 And uh, you know, an equally compelling um, conversation could be around China and its place in the world, and the silliness also about the emergence of China. If anything, it's the re-emergence of China and. Uh, what that does to sort of uh, uh, make vulnerable, if you will, the Western um, civilization, if you will, and culture and polity and so on and so forth. And, and in our part of the world, Hamid, also, of course, it's the Persian and the Arab and the... Uh, oh, of course, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and all silliness, Sunni is this, Shia is that. Uh, or Persians did it this way, the Arab, I mean, these are all false and flawed and outdated more than anything else categories. Yes, and what you're calling for, I mean, in summary, <coughs> is really a reframing in our minds, a questioning, a change in how we treat these questions, how we think about them. And if you're calling for something, it is a more global, a more inclusive, a more complex, a more nuanced, a more historically accurate, if you will, um, a representation um, of, of, um, of, 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 of such. So let me, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Merve, but, you know, Salam Mir um, put on a, a question that uh, uh, Salam is proposing that uh, Western philosophy, uh, that philosopher, Western philosophers are actually realizing that Western philosophy is multicultural and hybrid rather than purely Western, which is a very positive, if you will, hopeful uh, note. Do you, do you agree with that? Uh, except for calling it Western philosophy, that philosophy is indeed multifaceted and is pluralistic. It has all sorts of elements from other uh, cultures, non-European cultures. Europe itself is a recently coined and invented metaphor. We have to understand it as a, as a metaphor. And uh, that will enable us to see the significance of Egypt, of India, of, of Iran, of uh, uh, knowledge goes with power. This is a simplistic yeah. uh, uh, insight of Foucault. Knowledge is where at, at one time Arabs were producing knowledge because they controlled the world. At, before that, Persians were doing it. The Spanish were doing it. The, the greatest civilization, uh, the, the greatest empire of all time was the Mongol empire and they were producing knowledge, the Russian were producing it. So we need to sort of place this thing called the West in its historical context. Uh, the historicization would prevent demonization that they did everything wrong and, and so forth. They did some atrocious thing around the globe and we still are seeing the consequences. I just wrote a piece about the, the queen's celebration of how many decades that she has. They don't see what they have done to the world. So we need to re remind them, but not in a vindictive way. We have, right, I mean, go, go back to the Persian Arab issues. As you know, in the Gulf area where you're going, alas, they call it, oh, is it Arab Gulf or the Persian Gulf? I say, well, I call it by its real name. It's American Gulf. I mean, it's all dominated by the American <laughs> warships. 
Yes, that one is statistically, there are studies done by colleagues at Yale that in 25 years, that entire region is no longer habitable because of the uh, environmental issues. Is yeah. the environmental issues that are paramount, not whether you call it Persian or Arabic or bring documents from the time of this and that. Give me a break. Yeah, yeah. Um, we must break and I'm going to turn it over to Merve. But uh, first, uh, Hamid, this was so wonderful thank you thank you and my I... pleasure thank for taking time uh safwan to coming with us we will miss you physically here thank in you. new york but you will with you you can take yourself out of colombia but you can't get colombia out of you you will still be part of it <laughs> thank you thank you thank you and i never intend to take colombia out of me and colombia to me is is my you pleasure. and Our colleagues pleasure. and friends yeah. whom i look forward to seeing again uh, we have a dinner date in uh, September. We will put that on the calendar Pleasure. and uh, invite some of our colleagues with us. And uh, I look forward to hosting you in Doha. Uh, thank good luck, you. Yeah, good luck with your new positions. They're lucky to have you. And you. Uh, you will, will bring a fresh perspective with a global perspective and the work, uh, extraordinary work that you've done. Uh, Georgetown is lucky to have you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Hamid. Merve, over to you. And thank just, you and just, feedback and your colleagues. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Dabashi and Professor Masri, because this was very timely, very important topic. That uh, And we would like to thank our audience uh, who were with us uh, for more than an hour with uh, really fascinating questions. Uh, so we highly, uh, so we, we put the uh, link of your book uh, and it's a fascinating book and we will read over and over again and rethink about these uh, fictitious uh, binaries over and over. Uh, thank so thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and also my thank to you, Merve, and to IPEC and your colleagues at the at Istanbul Center. The more you do this, the more we feel that you're part of us. It's just an extension of our uh, thinking in Istanbul, in uh, in uh, Tunis, and in uh, Amman. Uh, thank you for hosting this. Thank you for arranging for this. I'm delighted and grateful that you enabled the conversation with Safwan about my new book. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Ma'as-salama. Ma'as-salama, ya Jazeera.